Uh, good afternoon, everybody here. So hello, my name is Tyler Dick, and welcome to the WW Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take care of a, a few housekeeping items. So if you have a cell phone, please silence it for the, the presentation here. Uh, in the event of emergency, if we have a fire alarm, please exit from either one of the doors on the side of the room. Uh, take the nearest safe stairway down to the first floor of the building and exit and assemble across the street by our, our new civil engineering building and hydro systems lab uh, across Main Street. Uh, please use the buddy system, look to your right and left to make sure those people get out and join you safely over across the street. Uh, in the event of severe weather, which hopefully won't be severe cold today, uh, we should go to the basement. The best way to get there is to use the exits. Again, proceed down the, uh, the hallway into the old portion of Newmark Lab, go down the stairs there and go down to the, the basement. And our students here will lead us down there. If you didn't swipe your ID card when you uh, picked up your pizza, please be sure to sign the attendance sheet uh, with your name and affiliation. And if you did not receive a direct email announcement of the seminar, but would like to, please uh, include your email address on that leg legibly. Uh, just during the presentation, I'd like to remind the speaker, uh, please repeat any questions from the audience for the benefit of the online audience. If we can't get a microphone to them, uh, should be okay here. So the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar Series is sponsored by the Rail Transportation Engineering Center here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. On behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank the Association of American Railroads, BNSF, CN, Hanson Professional Services, and Union Pacific for their ongoing support of Railtech. It's greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as those of us uh, participating via the internet. Speaking of the internet, I wanna welcome the over 150 people from 14 different countries who registered to attend this seminar. The list of attendees includes freight and passenger railroads, transit organizations, federal and state DOTs, engineering firms, universities, research organizations, technology developers and suppliers, and many others. I'm very pleased that everyone can join us online. Those of you who are joining us online and want to receive PDHs for your participation, uh, we can issue those if you've completed payment. And if you need that link, please send us an email at the Hayes Seminar email address that was included in the email announcement. So today's presentation will discuss heavy haul freight railroads and how they exist to provide transportation services but they're also businesses selling products of transportation services. This leads to important questions of how heavy haul freight railroads design their transportation products to attract and serve customers and how railroad service providers uh, products are translated into operating models. Equally important questions arise regarding the crit critical operating resources and how they are sized and brought together to ensure capability of delivering the transportation products promised to customers. Tom Haley, our speaker today, is retired vice president of network planning and operation at Union Pacific, and he'll be discussing these issues, which are essential to heavy haul freight railroad operations and businesses. So Mr. Haley's 36 year railroad career involved experience in both railroad operations and finance. He began his railroad career as a college intern with CSX in 1983, followed by field operations and locomotive management assignments. After earning his Master's of Business Administration from Indiana University, Haley joined Union Pacific Railroad Finance Department in 1989, moved to the Operating Department in 1993, and advanced through several positions leading to assume a leadership role at Union Pacific. At the time of his retirement in 2019, after more than 30 years with Union Pacific, Mr. Haley was UP's Vice President of Network Planning and Operations. He and his team at UP were responsible for designing the service product and for the planning and analysis of UP's critical operating resources, including workforce, locomotives, and infrastructure capacity. In his role as Vice President, Mr. Haley also led UP's Joint Facilities Team and their Network Development Team, which helped facilitate public-private partnerships, including Metrolink in Los Angeles, Metro into Chicago, and elements of the Chicago Crate Program. Over his long railroad career, Tom has been involved in railroad field operations, locomotive management, fuel efficiency, terminal operations, infrastructure and resource investments, network design and operating strategies, and the development of UP's extensive rail network. I'm very pleased to introduce Tom Haley, who will present today's seminar entitled Network Design and Resource Planning in the North American Heavy Haul Freight Environment. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Chris, thanks a lot for inviting me down. Uh, you and Riley and Tyler, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Um, can you all hear me? Can you hear me in this room? Okay, so, um, sir. 
So, um, is that better? Can you can you still hear me in the room? Yeah. All right. Uh, so I'm not accustomed to making presentations with a mask on. Understand the rules here. All good. Uh, one of you give me the signal if it gets mushy or I start fading away on you, okay? I'll do my best. Got the mic on. Uh, I want to make sure I connect with all you. Very happy to be here. Um, our topic today is network planning and design in the heavy haul uh, freight railroad environment. And let's set the table for that. Um, when you think about the railroad business, always start here. Um, heavy haul freight railroads exist to provide transportation services. Uh, they're businesses selling a product and its service. Always start with service. All issues of productivity, equipment, and infrastructure are meaningless without a product and without customers. That's why railroads exist. It's very simple yet profound. I always like to start here. Sometimes we get a little lost in our focus on productivity, uh, equipment, and infrastructure. Um, our ultimate purpose is to serve customers. Without customers, there's no freight, no revenue, no business, and no purpose for the railroad. Um, so let's build on that. I'm just adding some bullets to that same slide. The questions here, uh, Tyler summarized, and it's what I want to address with you today. How do heavy haul freight railroads design their transportation products to attract and serve customers? They operate in a competitive marketplace. How do you put something out there customers want? How are railroad service products translated into operating models? What are the critical operating resources and how are they sized and brought together to ensure capability of delivering the transportation products that we promise to customers? How do we do that? We promise a product, how do we deliver it? These issues are essential to heavy haul freight operations and to the business. So let's go with that agenda. Uh, got a little bit up here. I was going to make sure you had some background on me. Tyler really uh, covered this. Uh, I retired in 2019 uh, as vice president network planning and operation at Union Pacific. Uh, the NPO team that I led was responsible for the things you see there, ensuring delivery capability for high quality, efficient service products to customers, designing UP service product, the planning and analysis of the critical operating resources, including infrastructure, workforce, and equipment, uh, designing the system of operating key performance metrics or KPIs, Joint facilities is the shared facilities between railroads, like in terminal areas, Chicago, St. Louis, Houston, places like that. Uh, and then developing the network with public-private partnerships, uh, which Tyler also mentioned, that's PPPs up there, passenger operators, public investment and in infrastructure. Um, I just added the bottom part to the slide. I'm not gonna plow through that again. Tyler really covered it. Got about 36 years uh, career span starting in 1983. Um, and uh, you can see my more than 30 years with UP. That was the majority of it. I was an executive officer at UP for 17 of those years. And uh, my experience uh, covers all those items really at the bottom in one way or another. I guess the most important line here is the one that I put at the bottom in red. Uh, as I've said several times now, thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to share experience with you. Um, I've done a lot of things. Um, I am not speaking for Union Pacific or any particular railroad or company. I'm retired. I'm happily retired. Uh, and uh, go do things now like spend time in Colorado and Arizona and Florida and those kinds of things. But... I want to share my experience with you. So uh, 
that's what I'm about here today. Okay. Um, let's talk about the need. The need for this function that I'm calling network planning and design. The most fundamental need is that the railroad has to be able to sell a product that can actually deliver and then have the ability to deliver what it sells. That's another simple yet profound statement. How do we, how do we understand our capabilities? How do we equip ourselves to ensure competitive, reliable products in the marketplace? That doesn't just happen. So again, we spend a lot of time looking at individual components or factors of production, but you got to bring them together somehow and put that product out there. <clears throat> um, I'm building again on the slide. Long lead times. Long lead times, very important. Um, you can't just pick up the phone and change resource levels with a railroad. They have long lead times ranging from months to years. Uh, I organized their workforce equipment infrastructure. That's kind of shortest term to longest term. Putting the shortest term workforce resource in place on a railroad takes months. Uh, you got to source people, you got to train them particularly locomotive engineers, that's a skilled job. So you don't just change that. Infrastructure is typically the longest lead time. You're putting iron in the ground. You're dealing with permits, construction. Uh, that's, uh, that's the longest. So you gotta be looking forward. And then the third area of need, which again, I'm just building here, is to integrate markets, products, and operations. So I've put a model here at the bottom of this, this slide, uh, and you see network planning or design and integration and the blue arrows, that's the interface, whatever you wanna call it. It sits between the markets and the marketing function, which is on the left, and the transportation products, which are largely tied to how the railroad operates, which are on the right. Um, the products tied mostly to how the railroad operates are intermodal or premium products. Uh, the carload product, which is a lot of railroaders call the manifest, loose car, loose car business, box cars, tank cars, that kind of thing. And then the bulk products, uh, which typically operate in unit trains and move from stockpile to stockpile. So the railroad tends to operate these ways. We're trying to serve markets over there. And uh, that integration role is a key need for network planning and design. Said another way, it's a matter of how you serve the individual markets on the left with a train network that's not market specific, but is market responsive. Okay, you gotta make that bridge. Um, precision scheduled railroading or PSR uh, blurs some of these distinctions. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, Regardless though, how you choose to operate, regardless of how you choose to operate, you gotta have a mechanism to bridge from market to operation. And you gotta do it in such a way that the railroad is selling what it can do and then doing what it sells. That, me that mechanism I'm describing is what I'm calling network planning. Okay, everybody on page with that? Good, okay. Let's take that same model that I just walked you through, put it in the upper left and add this orange box and elaborate a little bit on what the products look like. Um, I'm giving you three dimensions, speed, consistency in the model, the operating model. And the orange arrow is range, it's a spectrum. 
So <laughs> the premium product, the speed, you're essentially competing with team driver trucks. Driver drives, he gets off, she gets off, next one gets on, okay? Cover a lot of miles in a day. That's the most premium. As you move down to standard intermodal, auto, the manifest product, it's more single driver truck, where truckers drive rest, then drive some more. Also competing rail. The bulk is more about making cycles. Again, you're going stockpile to stockpile, stockpile to port. The consistency dimension starts with meeting specific cutoff and delivery appointments. So what I mean by that in the most premium product, it's something like you give me your box of freight by 7 p.m. tonight, you'll make this evening's train and I'll have it on the ground at the other end by 4 a.m. the second day waiting for you to deliver the drayer to the drayage to deliver it to the ultimate customer. As you move down the market and product chain, this kind of widens to delivery on the day promised when you get down here. When you get into manifest and local service, the dimension of local service becomes very important. So it becomes more of a do what you promise. So if you tell me you're gonna deliver it today, deliver it today, right? You're gonna serve me today. And, uh, and then stockpiles in the bulk cycle typically act as buffers. The model there obviously at the top, highly scheduled, uh, focused on runtime and minimizing dwell. Uh, it moves down to scheduled, including pickup, delivery, and connections. And then the cycles are more on demand in the bulk world uh, on a demand basis. Okay. Um, now let's take that visual and I'm just adding a couple of bullet points and points I want to make with you at the bottom. Um, speed and consistency matter. I'm taking you back to the service paradigm. Um, they matter a lot. I've talked to customers <laughs> quite a bit in my career. Um, you know, I could go on about all the reasons I believe that and all the reasons many people I know and respect who are expert in the field will tell you that uh, they matter. Don't ever let yourself believe that the railroad can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, and the customers will put up with it. Um, that kind of thinking costs the railroad precious traffic and market share. Um, remember what I said earlier, transportation is the business of moving things. We're in the supply chains of our customers. Nobody wants to carry extra inventory for a poor quality, unreliable service. Comes back to service. You gotta have a good product and to make it, you need a formal transportation plan. So this is the internal blueprint to make your service product. Uh, you can see dimensions there. It schedules locals, trains, and connections. It specifies who, what, when, and where things happen in your operation. Call that the transportation plan. Um, it focuses the activity of the organization on producing service. And it drives resource productivity. It's the blueprint for what are my productive trains? How do I achieve equip, uh, productive equipment turns? How do I make good use of people? Okay, and let's add this orange point right here, which is important. The transportation plan has to be highly visible and widely accessible. Um, it needs to be in the daily dialogue of running the railroad. Questions like, did you run the train and the plan? How are we doing against today's plan? This has to be in the dialogue of, of running the railroad, that kind of discipline. 
and everyone needs access to it. Desktop, laptop, iPhone, you gotta be able to see this T-plan. That's the blueprint for the product. The operation needs a rhythm around the operating plan for making transportation. Okay, everybody looks like they're still tracking, great. Um, I'm gonna pop that model up there, same model, just shrink it up to make some other points here. Um, one of the most fundamental trade-offs in the operation and in designing it is train size versus Cardwell versus work events. Let's spend some time. We want to wrap our minds around that. Work events are picking up and setting out cars with trains en route. This is a hot topic right now and one that has shifted with uh, the onslaught of precision scheduled railroading. I tell people pick two. If you don't wanna do work events, that's the stopping and picking up and setting out en route, uh, combining trains, and you want low car dwell in your terminals, then you're gonna run frequent trains from point to point which tends to create smaller train sizes. If you don't like all the train starts from smaller train sizes, you want larger trains, but you still don't want work events uh, or combining trains, then you're gonna collect cars at terminals, run fewer larger trains end to end, and the result will be higher car dwell. You're going to sit on the cars till you got a big train. Run it end to end. Uh, that will also put more car inventory in your network, which has issues. If you want big trains and you want to keep the cars moving faster, then you're going to pick up and set out along the way. And you're going to combine trains. And you're going to swing cars around terminals. And that, in a fundamental sense, is PSR, Precision Schedule Railroad, right? Everybody with me on this? Pick two. It's not that simple. I mean, you can obviously blend them, but you see the trade-off there. I have lived all three of those models. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about evolution because it gives you some perspective on where the railroad industry has been, where we are now, and where I'm gonna take you with this today is some thoughts on where it needs to go. Um, Post deregulation, the first point there, after deregulation, which began in 1980, the railroads generally migrated toward a product and market focus to provide better service, compete, and grow. Uh, speaking broadly, we did that with three distinct service networks, premium manifest bulk, which I've discussed kind of where I came in. And we operated them separately. My career spans that era. I started in railroading in 1983. We're just really getting into that model. Uh, so I have a, a long perspective on that. Um, importantly, we were trying to achieve two-person train crews, so we wanted to minimize work events. Uh, work events are slow and difficult with only one person working on the ground, so to get the two-person train crews from four or five-person train crews, we designed the train operation to move directly from one large efficient terminal to another. We streamlined the operation, we employed technology, we gain velocity, we achieve the labor savings. The industry became much more profitable. We invested heavily in ourselves and we grew. Uh, the market value of the railroads increased more than tenfold over that era. The recent trend, which is at the bottom, has been to blend the service networks more to increase train size and reduce crew starts. This has added a lot of work events in terminals and on line of road 
to yield huge trains and to swing cars around terminals to offset the speed losses from all the slower speeds in the network. In some respects, it's back to the op operation pre-deregulation when railroads were fighting to survive and trying to minimize costs. So we're, we're making, a, we've been making a migration here to this, then to this, okay? All right, uh, enough of that. Let's talk a minute about schedule making and KPIs. Um, same model up at the top, um, schedule making. Um, the best way to make schedules in the heavy haul freight environment is to do it based on historical performance at a target percentile. An example of that would be 80% of trains of this profile require X amount of runtime on this segment. If instead you do it based on average runtime, you're going to get something around 50% on time performance, as you'd expect, right? Uh, which means you'll miss car connections and ramp grounding times, disappoint your customers, and so on. The issue in that is the skew. The typical runtime performance curve in a heavy haul has got a tail on it, a late tail. So doing it on a percentile basis, I believe, is the most effective way to do it. There is some art in this. You want an achievable operation, but you don't want to design in failure and mediocrity. You want the operating team to stretch to make a good competitive product. This requires analysis by segment, by corridor, and some good smart minds to wire it up, and of course, input from the operating people who must deliver it. Um, I've made the point, the third sub bullet there under schedule making, performance varies widely with track configuration, capacity consumption, traffic mix, work events. That's what you're trying to overcome. Um, there's an opportunity for simulation here. Uh, if you think about it, setting schedules on historical performance kind of builds in whatever history is. And uh, a good heavy haul simulation model would be valuable. Um, KPIs, uh, I broke the KPIs into end of process and in process. The ultimate end of process or outcome KPI is delivery of the product versus what you sold to the customer. You've got to measure that. You got to know if you're delivering what you sold. Um, the in process indicators you can see down here at the bottom. Um, you know, I like a, a plan compliance measure. Um, if people aren't following the plan, uh, why not? Is it a bad plan? Is it a discipline issue? If you don't have a way to, to, to focus that and you have service issues, you don't know if it's a bad plan or if it's bad execution. So you, you, gotta, you gotta wrap something around that. The local service, local spot and poll, um, I have seen data over the years that indicates for carload shippers, the local service is actually the biggest driver of their satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Um, terminal connection performance, this is train to train. Uh, train performance, so here's my work events, terminal dwell, train size are all in here. That's getting at those trade-offs I was talking about earlier. Uh, I like car velocity. One, uh, one good thing that PSR has brought to the table, in my opinion, is a greater focus on car velocity. I like that. Uh, that says a lot about equipment turns, uh, what you're doing with the customer's shipment. And uh, that needs to be in there. And then resource productivity. Okay. 
Um, now, I'm going to shift over to resource planning. So we talked about designing the service. Now I got to hang resources on it to actually do it or to enable the operating team to do it. So I got my same blue model up there in the upper left. The markets, which is the customer's view of life, the products, the operations, and now the resources. Uh, which I put up there in uh, orange. Five critical resources required to operate the railroad are listed up there in the orange box. Workforce, I'm talking about train, engine, and yard, the people who run the trains, freight cars, locomotives, line capacity, and terminal capacity. The plot that I've done here on the right that ranges from shared to unique is a visual on how, to what degree those resources are shared among the service networks. So in the case of uh, train crews, um, it's highly shared, right? So I'm sure you all know this, but in case you don't, railroad train crews are geography specific. Railroad train crews don't run from Chicago to Los Angeles. Railroad train crews run from uh, Chicago to uh, Effingham or Chicago to St. Louis, right? All the time, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Today, they may operate a manifest train. Tomorrow, they may operate an intermodal train on their territory. They're shared between the service networks. Freight cars are usually the most unique um, to the service products. So double stack well, coal car, so on. They're pretty well tied to premium manifest and bulk. Locomotives are highly shared, but not entirely. Railroads typically focus certain locomotives and local and yard ser service. AC power and the heaviest haul operations and so on. Line capacity is highly shared. Uh, terminal capacities are much more unique. Intermodal ramps, auto ramps, manifest yards, port facilities, coal loadouts, receivers, all tend to be unique to that product. So putting the resources together is um, an interesting challenge of thinking about the service networks, a forecast, and how much you're gonna be able to share them. All right, so what? <laughs> well, remember the long lead times um, on resources. A good framework is the one I've got here uh, under a key concept time frame. Um, time frame, it's a good way to, to think about the operation, good way to organize it. Uh, network planning, as I'm describing it, works mostly in the strategic time frame, which is six months to five plus years out. Uh, and that's because we're trying to acquire resources. Network operations is about distributing and assigning those resources in the tactical time frame. So examples here would be locomotive management at a railroad or freight car management. You're, you're distributing the resources across the network. Those decisions are being made two, three, four days, a week out, sometimes longer. And then the dispatch function on the real time, the dispatch function of field operations are, are turning the wheels right now. They're lining the switches, moving the trains, uh, executing the service product. Let me add the, the implication of that. Um, you got to have a forecast. Now, I'm speaking of the network planning strategic time frame here, which is our subject today. You got to have a forecast, right? Um, you can't be looking out six months to five plus years without some idea of where your business and your operation is gonna go. The best model I've seen is to have a forecast that's driven by the marketing and sales team. 
uh, and and that based on customer input. You want to tie back to what your customers are going to do if you can. That lets you tie to the marketplace, makes you a full partner in the customer supply chain. The forecasts must have geographical specificity. Workforce, line capacity, terminal capacity are all geographically fixed. You need to understand the outlook for premium manifest and bulk kind of as separate groups of traffic because some of the critical resources are unique to the product. And ideally, you also want to understand seasonality because it lets you share between market demand. So you want to be able to, grain has a peak, intermodal has a peak, auto has a peak. You want to be able to share resources. A good approach is to generate a forecast with a statistical package such as SAS, put it in front of the marketing and sales team and have them adjust it based on their knowledge and customer input. Okay, I'm going to uh, just say a few words about each of those five critical resources and uh, I'll uh, shave a little time here if I need to, and we can talk about them more at the three o'clock uh, seminar. Let me start with workforce. So uh, as you can see there in my bullets, the lead time on TE and Y workforce, six to 18 months. So you're making conductors and engineers. The typical progression is conductor, train, hire conductor, conductor experience. Then you go through engineering training with a conductor you make an engineer. Engineers are highly skilled. It takes a while. Uh, don't ever run out of engineers because the time to recover is a long, long time. Um, the basic model drivers are the forecast, which I just talked about, the A, prospective T plan, meaning a forward looking transportation plan. So I got a forecast. How do I think I'm going to operate it? What are my crew starts? That's the basic driver of the demand for people. Looking out six months, looking out a year, looking out two years. Some of the key inputs there, separating road versus yard and local starts. Um, yard and local starts tend to be more stable in eras of growth or shrinkage. Uh, at least that's been my experience. You got to have an efficiency assumption. Recrew rate is uh, how many times I have to use a second crew to get a train over a crew district because we ran out of time. Crews can work 12 hours, have to be replaced. Vacation. Um, people want vacation oftentimes different than the railroad needs them. Attrition. Training, how long, how many people am I going to have in training? How long is it going to be? Engineer promotion, seasonality. There's a lot of moving parts there, but if you do that right, uh, and it can be done in good modeling, you can hire people so they graduate during a time of peak need, and then let attrition work them off during periods of less need, so that you keep people employed. Train crews don't get paid if they don't work. They're not salaried. So you wanna be a good employer, which is what's down here, right? If you work them too hard, they'll lay off, I'm tired. If you don't work them enough, you'll starve them. So you wanna put a lot of thought in this, have a good workforce, uh, have them, motivated uh, as best you can uh, working, but not overdone. And, uh, and then my uh, last point there, you got to plan workforce at the, at the seniority agreement or the hub or crew district level. What I mean by that is you can't do the whole network in aggregate. You got to have a crew plan for uh, Chicago to Champaign, Champaign to, 
to uh, wherever CN goes. I'm making these up, but crew district by crew district, okay? You gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta have it at that level. You can't, you can't pick up engineers who run in the Texas Gulf and say, hey, I need you in the Tehachapi Mountains. So get on a plane and go out there. You can't do that. They have to be trained to do that. And it takes a long time. So you gotta be planning it at the crew district level. Okay, freight cars. Um, you know, uh, days to a year and a half. The days is um, if you have cars in storage, pull them out pretty easily. Remember, freight cars are shared by railroads. So one strategy, depending on what else is going on in the industry, is to use borrowing, car hire, leasing to move uh, fleets back and forth. Um, which means you have to think beyond your borders. And that's important. Uh, you got to get it down to car type. So you can't, you can't just say, how many total freight cars do I need? You got to be down in something that's more like 40 car types, plus or minus, rather than even eight or 10, because equipment's pretty different depending on the market it serves. Uh, some of the inputs, you see them there, cycle time, customer behavior, seasonality, how am I gonna do car supply? And then there are some big, big financial decisions, uh, really in all these resources, of course, um, but in the car supply, am I going to buy them? Am I going to lease them? Am I going to borrow them? Am I going to pay car hire on them? Am I going to ask my customer to own them? All strategic decisions. Locomotives. Um, you know, locomotives are the most fungible of all the resources. They give you a lot of operating flexibility because you can move them anywhere. And although you have preferred services for them, you can really pull about anything with them. Um, so they give you a lot of flexibility and recoverability. Uh, in this case, the best way I've seen to, to, to drive locomotive sizing, forecast premium manifest bulk, make a productivity assumption and drive demand. Um, some of the inputs you can see there, productivity by traffic type. I like the metric gross ton miles per horsepower day because it ties to productivity in terms of work. It ties to horsepower, which is what you're buying and rostering in your fleet. And it ties to time. Um, service standards. You can starve a railroad on locomotives, hold trains for power, you can drive locomotive productivity up doing that. You may make a lousy service product. So what am I trying to achieve in service? I don't wanna hold trains for power, at least not very much. And then, uh, and then the supply, you know, you got an overhaul plan, you got a retirement plan, you gotta lay all that up. So what have I got? Ultimately, it's a supply and demand thing. <clears throat> um, you can build the productivity assumption bottom up. What's my dwell, locomotive dwell assumption? What's my avail availability, which means how much time are they out of the shop available to work? What's my power to weight ratio in my product? That's part of the product design, which is a link here. What technology have I got that's gonna change the game here one way or the other? Uh, what I would tell you is, I guess there's two points here that I'd really like to make with you. One is um, distinguish between goals and planning assumptions. So all of these things, dwell availability, uh, hours held by power, productivity, you may have goals for. And goals are usually stretches 
because the organization's organized around this stuff. So the mechanical team has a, an availability goal. If you wire all that up just on goal and you plan on that, you will fall short because not everybody makes all their goals. You might, you might be surprised on the upside. I believe the right way to do it, set all those goals, do a planning assumption that's realistic, that gives an opportunity to have surge capacity. Something goes wrong in the network. I get more traffic than I thought I was going to have. Some ability to deal with that. And this is an important resource to do that with. The other point I'd make is don't let the tail wag the dog. Um, this is controversial, really. Uh, but think about this with me for just a minute. So I've got an industry here that's somewhere around a 60 operating ratio, 60. So as you probably all know, uh, that means that on every dollar of revenue, about 60 cents of its expense, which means about 40 cents is operating profit margin, 40 cents. 60 cents operating expense against operating revenue. Okay, so locomotive expense is typically 15 to 20% of operating expense. So on a dollar of revenue, 60% operating expense, 15 to 20% of that is locomotive expense. So that's like nine to 12 cents on a dollar of revenue. Now, if I'm going after a five to 10% improvement in locomotive productivity, I'm going after a penny on a dollar of revenue. Is that important? Yes. I'll take a penny on a dollar of revenue and productivity all day long. Unless in doing it, I jeopardize the 40% operating profit margin that's on every dollar of revenue. A penny versus 40 pennies of operating profit margin is no contest. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying it's not really important. It is. I'm saying don't let the tail wag the dog. If you do something down here to chisel out productivity, you harm service and you drive some business away, you are doing something worse than stepping over dollars to pick up dimes because the margin's so big now. Okay, first objective, my last line there. First objective is the service product. This, the resource productivity is the next order objective. Let me make sure I've made all my points around that. Again, it's, a, it's an issue of, we get very focused on optimizing an individual resource and our perspective gets kind of lost that the traffic level is going to be what it is. Without thinking about by tuning what we're doing over here in the operation, we may change the traffic level for better or worse. Just saying, think about it. Got to think about it. All right. You know, line and terminal capacity. Uh, it is the least fungible. Long lead time. You put it in the ground. There it is. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't thrash through what capacity is a function of. Um, you all probably know a lot about that already anyway. You know, it's, it's uh, speed and grade, it's distance between sightings. You can read it there. Terminal capacity, uh, whether it's a manifest yard or an intermodal ramp or an auto ramp is some combination of number and length of tracks and dwell or turnover. Um, 
you break it out by component, you know, different parts of the terminal have different capacities. Where's the bottleneck? Uh, we did all that work. I've been involved in that work uh, for years. Uh, consumption, you know, it's good to think about this. How am I consuming it? Um, classic trade-offs here, you know, also out there in the PSR world. PSR runs fewer trains. That's good in terms of not consuming as much capacity. They're big trains. They don't fit in sidings. That can go the other way on you. It's all a part of the design decision and the investment decision, obviously. Um, this, this, this is an important point. Uh, the best improvement sequence is process improvement, then add people, then add technology and equipment, and then put iron in the ground. Iron in the ground is last. It's real expensive. And once it's in the ground, it's really hard to take it back up and move it. So the easiest, most effective thing for the organization to do is improve processes, improve processing times, improve whatever to get better use out of the resource. Adding people can be adjusted up and down, technology and equipment. You guys work on a lot of that stuff, right? This one out here, when it comes time to do this, you got to really think about it. Uh, do I really need to do this? Um, have I got my eyes on the right project? What, let's get what the operating and engineering teams to put the right project in the right place. Uh, simulation's helpful. There are a couple of good tools out there uh, on uh, capacity simulation. All right, I need to roll up here. Um, we've picked our operating model. We've designed our service. This is kind of what I've talked about. We've put resources on it. Uh, so we've got a forward look. We have the right resources, right place, right time. Uh, the operating team's now equipped to execute, okay? There's one other important dynamic that I want to mention here, and that's the network dynamic. Today's largest North American railroads are networks, and a network has implications. Um, you can see them there, uh, the five listed in the upper left and the research uh, reference that I've put on the slide. Um, I'll pick one, connectivity and interaction, which I think is the third one down, fourth one down. Um, here's an illustration. Service interruption in Nebraska or Texas. You run out of locomotives on the West Coast three to four days later because the network center connected. So you stop something here and an outcome happens over here, right? Uh, then you catch up the coast and you overwhelm coming back east the gateways and bottlenecks in your network. Uh, it's like a wave, okay? Connectivity and interaction. So what do you do about that? It's our design principles. Um, you design in surge capability. You design in recoverability and you manage bottlenecks. You know where the bottlenecks are in your network and you manage them. Um, so in the example I gave about the waves, the interruption and the waves to the coast and back, uh, a strategy would be to be smart enough to put some locomotives in short-term storage in the right places on the coast. And when you have the service interruption, you see the supply fall off, you fire them up, and you launch east right on plan, nice and steady. You don't do the waves, you don't do the overwhelm, you don't crash your bottlenecks. Then as the network comes back in sync, you take them back out, put them back in storage, you've delivered a good service product, and you've made your customers happy. And you've also eliminated a lot of failure cost. You're the perfect group to make this point. 
I know of no robust rail network, network level simulation tool. If you guys know about it, tell me about it, and I'll pass that information around some of my friends in the business. I'm talking about a tool that models at the network level. Uh, considering the resources and the constraints. Such a tool would be very valuable. Um, you could do what ifs on resource levels. You could do what ifs on network management decisions, like I'm talking about here. Okay. Let's put it together now as a business. Um, rail growth potential is massive in North America, particularly in the United States. Um, ultimately, a successful business needs to be profitable and it needs to grow. For the heavy haul freight railroads, this is a good news, bad news story. The good news is the heavy haul freight railroads are now highly profitable and the potential for growth is massive. That's the first sub bullet up there. Rail intermodal handles just 11% of truckload freight, drive in and reefer loads moving more than 500 miles. The uh, the reference is cited at the bottom for that statistic. That means there's a massive opportunity. Um, the bad news for the industry is there's been relatively little growth during a truck driver shortage. What does that say about what we're doing as an industry? and the products that we're putting out and how competitive we are in the marketplace. Just blowing that out a little bit. This is the stat on the 500 miles, a couple other stats floating around out there, again, cited. Uh, if you move it to a ton mile comparison, it's better. 28% of the ton miles belong to the railroads. On a value basis, 58% trucks. Railroads are moving less on a, of the valuable stuff, right? Just make the points here, I think I've made them. So you gotta ask yourselves, uh, is the heavy haul industry really offering competitive service products? Um, could they be more? Yes, yes it is. Could it be more? It appears so. Challenge yourselves. How much time do all of you spend working on productivity versus service performance? And then I'll wind you up. So the first two bullets here, this is a build slide. First two bullets are the two that I just had just collapsed. So starting with the third bullet there, the trend in the industry has been to grow earnings per share by focusing on the highest margin traffic, slashing costs, raising prices, buying back shares, which puts fewer shares outstanding. That strategy makes more earnings per share but it does not necessarily make the most transportation. My view of the world national transportation policy should emphasize heavy haul rail. Um, four times more fuel efficient than truck, it's green. Highway safety and congestion is an issue that would be improved by less truck traffic. If you wanna read a great review of those points, uh, popularscience.com power trip excerpt it's a really good story it's a real raw for the railroads and uh and very interesting um i uh with my old colleagues and friends i argue that a growth strategy 
does maximize EPS. It's not a matter of do you get EPS with bullet number three up here, sub bullet number three, or do you grow? Growth does add EPS. If it's profitable growth, if you add profitable growth, you add more earnings, uh, which increases earnings per share. Um, a focus on margin is important, but it by itself is not sufficient. That's that point. I like this model the best, the last line there, which is balance the four constituents in the industry, the customer, the shareholder, the employee, and the public, right? That's a good business model. I've seen that model. I've been a part of it. I've worked with it. It's a very good way to do it. Okay, I'll leave you with the red line at the very bottom, uh, which is really about you. So this industry needs increasingly better ways and a better vision moving forward. Um, the North American heavy haul railroad industry needs to grow. It really needs to grow a lot, and it needs to do a bigger job serving the continent's transportation needs. Not just being forced into it by some heavy handed regulation, which sometimes I fear is going to happen if we don't figure out better and smarter ways to do it ourselves. That means we need bright minds, bright minds. Uh, I think the industry need for bright minds is greater than it's ever been. Um, and that's a big opportunity for people like you. So I'll leave you with that thought and uh, thank you for your time and attention. Well, thank you very much, Tom. It was an excellent seminar, putting a, a great framework around insights into network planning and design and the resources. So any questions here in the room? All the way back here. Mm. The lights. Thanks so much for the presentation. And early on in your presentation, you were talking about um, balancing speed or velocity as well as uh, basically consistency. And then I'll tie it with one of your last bullets of adding profitable traffic increases total profit. I was curious, what do you think comes first or how do you balance the train velocity or car velocity as well as consistency? Do those tie hand in hand or do you aim for consistency before increasing velocity or what is your general kind of thought process of how you go about adding traffic into your system? Uh, so I'm, I'm suffering a little from the echo here, so I'm not sure I got every component of that. I think the essence of it is when you're talking about speed and consistency, uh, what order do you solve that in? Um, my view of that is the, the speed or the service level of the product, I'm calling it that, but let's call it the, the, the speed of it, which was on my, my chart about different markets, uh, needs to be competitive. Right, it needs to be competitive. So if you're competing with the truckload carrier, it needs to look like that. And then whatever that is, so I'd start there, and then whatever that is, you got to do it reliably. Got to do it reliably. Some people will tell you now nah, railroads can be slower. You know, okay, maybe consistency is important, um, but I would start trying to match the competition. My view. Does that get it? Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you always want to have like, enough crews to support like, a surge. Yeah. But also make sure you're not employing too many people to avoid not working them enough. Yep. How do you manage that balance? Well, um, so in my case, we had a really good crew planning model that traded all that stuff off in a really talented person or people involved in it. 
And uh, with experience, you can get that about right, but not perfect. And there is, uh, there is flexibility in the crew resource, all right? It's not that brittle. So you can get it about right, and then if you have a big surge for some reason, you can stretch it for a while. Um, but if you keep doing that, then it starts breaking. On the other hand, if you just don't have enough traffic out there for it, you've over-resourced it, you'll just lose people. You know, people have to make a living. So, um, so how do you do it? You work on that balance. You try to have a good forecast and you have some very talented people involved. Uh, one person in particular was used to be on my team, what is, is on the team, used to be when I was managing it, who really understood that and could make that work. Yep. What else? Chris. Yeah. More than miles. Yep. Um, what are some ideas for how to get that up to fifteen percent? <laughs> um so one idea is uh railroads tend to think about origin and destination in their own network. So how do we reach across networks and gateways? to go after more traffic. How do we go after so-called watershed traffic, which might be from the Eastern portion of one rail network to the Western portion of another or vice versa and cross those boundaries. Um, you know, how do I make sure I've got a more reliable product? Why don't, why don't we have more freight uh, is it price is it reliability is it difficulty to use the railroad got to tackle that stuff the good news is I mean rail intermodal is is big and if you think about that uh, it's huge the opportunity that's out there yep that's the next my view is that's the next phase. And uh, I was serious when I talk about bright minds because the phase that spanned my career from deregulation through the rail renaissance to the onslaught of PSR, trying to take costs out, um, is probably not as challenging in many ways as really getting this will be. So the industry really needs talent. If the industry can figure out how to do that, the industry can be a growth industry and not just growth in earnings, which will come with it. That's obviously critical, my opinion. Hmm. So my, I can't full, I, I, I cannot, did everybody hear that question? Okay. I cannot fully uh, answer that um, because I am not deeply, deeply imbued in PSR. What I can tell you is when I talked about the transportation plan being the blueprint, which is back here on sl slide 12, the transportation plan as I worked with it did contain those elements. Train, blocks, locomotive requirements was in there. I have no reason to believe in a PSR environment you would not do that, but I can't absolutely speak to that. Okay? Uh, another question, a couple of these relate to, we have 
haven't heard about quality as being a sort of mantra for road industry for at least a, a couple decades, at least finally all went away. How does these quality concepts fit into your, your plan and you know, your, uh, uh, your vision here for service design and user experience? So, uh, so an obvious way it fits in is over here when I talked about capacity and I just happened to get it on that slide because infrastructure is so expensive. This hierarchy of process, people, technology, and equipment, and then iron in the ground starts with process. So process improvement is highly tied or highly the outcome of applying good quality principles and quality management. Yep, I saw a lot of the quality culture and worked with it at Union Pacific. Those are very important tools and process improvement can drive a lot of gain in all of these resources and service. Okay. Yeah, um, so we covered the system in a uniform approach to design, uh, analytics, resources, transportation plan, all the things I've talked about. We wrapped our mind around the network phenomenon. Uh, smaller railroads that just operated end to end or mostly end to end don't experience all of the dynamics of a network like a big railroad does today. And now we're so, there are so few and they're so big and so interconnected that the national system kind of operates that way. So besides the uniformity of planning, resourcing, analytics, uh, wrapping these design principles around UP, my experience uh, helped that a lot. Three o'clock, we do this, we can spend a little more time digging into some of this then. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and your attention, thank you. Oh, yeah? You can drink coffee or other adult beverages. Okay. And the significance of this mug is that um, 50 years ago, basically, it took this much fuel to move a ton of freight. Oh, wow. Uh, 27 miles on North American Railroad. Mm -hmm. Today, it only takes half as much. Wow. So. That's outstanding. Thank you very, very much. And, and, and at least part of that improvement is the result of some of the work like you people do at Railtech. So I congratulate you on that as well. Thank, thank you, you Chris. Yeah, Chris. thank you. Thank you.